願いしますお願いします,お,願いしますお願いします,しますお願いしますお願いしますこれは日本の国連の情報。Created six years ago, this brigade of elite commandos can operate at sea as well as on land. Modeled on the US Marine Corps, they're another sign of Japan's new, more assertive military build up. Sakura, こちら丸人ロンチャー2戦闘準備、射撃準備完了、事後戦闘準備移行する、終わり。Japan's US authored pacifist constitution went into effect in 1947. Unchanged to this day, it forbids Japan from maintaining a standing army. To get around the ban, the SDF were formed in 1954. They initially engaged in humanitarian aid, but have since transformed into an army in all but name, with 230,000 men and women in their ranks. My men can withstand all adverse conditions. In rain or snow, hot or cold, or in any difficult conditions, we can operate our rocket launchers in places where the enemy can't see them. And when enemy aircraft arrive, I'm certain we can destroy them. These exercises are an attempt to project strength to the outside world. In December 2022, Japan's government announced the biggest overhaul of its military since the Second World War. Its defense budget will double to 300 billion euros over five years, turning Japan into the third highest spender in the world behind the US and China. For critics, it marked the death of Japan's official commitment to pacifism. I can't openly say who's a threat to Japan. China's South China Sea operations worry me, and North Korea's nuclear bombs and missile tests. The peace and balance of power in the region is threatened from many sides. The Asia Pacific region produces 40% of global GDP and accounts for 60% of the world's population. A military conflict here would have far reaching consequences. At the center lies Taiwan, an island democracy Beijing has vowed will one day be reunited with the motherland. If war breaks out in the Taiwan Strait, this possibility will trigger World War III. The whole world economy will be set back by 20 years. If Japan and the US intervene and impede the reunification of China by force, they'll be badly beaten. Once dominated by the US, the Asia Pacific is now grappling with an increasingly assertive China, whose fleet of warships is the biggest in the world. There have already been skirmishes at sea. Harassment by Chinese Coast Guard vessels, collisions, reefs turned into military bases, and fishermen into militiamen. 
If you see boats in positions along fishing routes, but they're not actually fishing, it means they're getting money from the government. There are fishermen at the same time militiamen. They are not there just to catch fish to feed the people. They are also there to protect China's sovereignty. Xisha is part of China. It's the sacred land of China. We will not allow invaders to take even one grain of sand or one drop of seawater from here. If you control the South China Sea, you control three major important strategic issues, fish, oil, and traffic. That is why South China Sea is considered to be the hottest flashpoint of conflicts in the world. This is the new Cold War. On one side, Xi Jinping's strong authoritarian China. On the other, the US and its allies. A standoff complicated by territory, politics, the economy and ideology, and with the spectre of nuclear war in the background. It's here that the superpowers are jostling for supremacy. Based in Tahiti, these French soldiers are on a three-week deployment in Japan. All good? On est parti. They're taking part in a UN monitoring mission. Their Falcon patrols the seas looking for smugglers. With several territories in the Pacific, France wants to boost its presence in this strategically important zone. Our interview is interrupted. The Chinese fighter jet is tailing us. It follows our plane for one hour, a reminder to the French that they're not welcome here. The radiographer spotted the plane first. We're following its trajectory. Now it's flying parallel to us, around two nautical miles away. It's like a graceful, agile escort. Even when a plane is quite far away, we can take detailed images like this, which help our intelligence department identify the plane. Are you proud of this photo? Yes, I took it. The Shenyang J-16 fighter is one of the Chinese Air Force's newest aircraft. Chinese planes have been involved in several worrying incidents. In 2022, a Canadian plane on a UN surveillance mission had to change its route to avoid a collision after being pursued by a Chinese jet. In this incident, a Chinese fighter flew just three meters from an American bomber in complete darkness. This battle for control of the skies is played out almost daily. The Chinese aim is to stand their ground and wear down their adversaries. Despite the incident with the Chinese jet, the French continue their mission. In the sea off the Korean peninsula, they look for foreign ships transferring banned items to North Korean vessels. Under UN sanctions, no country, not even Pyongyang's ally China, is allowed to supply the regime with liquid fuel, coal or weapons. The French take aerial photos, but do not intervene. 123. There were no sanctions busting violations on this day, but France, which has monitored the region since 2018, has identified smugglers in the past. China's main objective is to extend its maritime territories. Under international law, a country controls all maritime resources up to 370 kilometers from its coastline. But Beijing lays claim to 90% of the entire South China Sea. Smaller neighboring countries can do little to prevent occupation of their territories. After all, China has another weapon on its side, its enormous population. By visiting waters also claimed by Vietnam, these patriotic Chinese tourists are driving home the message that the South China Sea belongs to China.
Their first stop is an island Chinese forces are turning into a base. Occupying soldiers have built military facilities on several reefs in the area in recent years. They've constructed landing strips, barracks and monitoring posts. The cost of the cruise starts at 850 euros per person for a four-day trip. Only Chinese citizens can join the tour and must pass a pre-departure test of loyalty to the regime in Beijing. 13 hours after leaving southern China, the tourists reach this uninhabited sandbank. The tiny island of Xuanfu is a slice of paradise surrounded by turquoise seas. Xisha is part of China. It's the sacred land of China. We won't allow invaders to take even one grain of sand or drop of seawater. Now please raise your right fist. Swear after me, I love my motherland. I love the Shisha Islands. When I was at school, I learned that Shisha is beautiful with abundant natural resources. I've always dreamed of coming here. The final stop is an island with just a few dozen residents, all of them Chinese. The government pays them six euros a day to live here in the middle of the South China Sea. This island belongs to China. There's no controversy. That's why we're here. We love our country. We also love swimming, and we want to swim in the Shisha Islands. An army in flip-flops and bathing suits. It's a civilian activities, but serving the overall military objectives of China of controlling the whole South China Sea area. If you collect many rocks, you collect many bodies of water, and therefore, greater fishing ground, greater marine resources, okay, greater areas where you can explore for possible natural gas and oil. The South China Sea has, has been declared as the next Persian Gulf because of a huge potential for natural gas and oil. Treasures that China is not prepared to give up. Beijing's strategy is to establish a presence in every part of the sea using tourists, soldiers and fishermen. We travel to Hainan, a major port in southern China, and a hub for vessels operating in the South China Sea. There are thousands of boats with red Chinese flags. Pretending to be tourists, we film with a hidden camera. We are Chinese, so we have to raise our national flag. If you don't, it's not OK. These fishermen confirm they can sail more than 1,000 kilometers from the Chinese coast. Are those areas offshore? No, they're not so far away, close to the Philippines. Philippines? Oh, it doesn't belong to China. Of course it belongs to China. It is Chinese territory, not the Philippines. But you said the Philippines. I just said that it's close to the Philippines. These are small countries. We're a big country. We meet a veteran fisherman who is more talkative than the others. He reveals one of the Chinese government's secrets. So we've altered his voice to protect his identity. If you see boats occupying positions on the routes, and they're not fishing, that means they're getting money from the country. He says some Chinese fishermen don't even fish. They're recruited for political reasons, to effectively occupy strategic waters claimed by China. 
You take your boat into the open sea to occupy a certain location, you come back once a month and you receive a monthly salary. How much? A captain gets 1,300 to 1,500 euros. For crew, it's 750 to 900 euros. They're not really fishing boats. They're sent there to perform certain tasks on the orders of the government. The Coast Guard accompanies them and helps them occupy their spot in the sea. We follow this fisherman to his friend's house in the hope of learning more about the role of the Chinese Coast Guard. The government in Manila has accused them of operating in Philippine waters. Does the Coast Guard help you if you have problems with foreign ships? Coast Guards who are bold enough will try to smash their boats. But those who are reluctant will stay away. It's like an army. It's like, it's, a, it's like a corporation. These are fishermen, but also serving the, the, the government, okay? So they are called the militia men. These militia, funded by the Chinese authorities, have been implicated in several incidents at sea. They include two collisions with Filipino boats over two days in October 2023. This Filipino captain was involved in a separate collision. This was my boat at the time. The stern broke after the Chinese collided with us from behind. This boat has been repaired. My crew started shouting in the middle of the night. I woke up. I just had time to see a ship bumping into us. I started the engine, but it was too late. The rear got hit. We were so scared. We thought we were going to die there. The collision occurred in the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, 140 kilometers from the coast. Junel and his 22 crew were rescued by Vietnamese fishermen. The incident made headlines around the world. If it was an accident, as soon as they hit us, they should have helped us. But when they saw us drowning, I had the impression that they tried to strike us again. But they missed us, and then they sailed away. There are more and more Chinese fishing vessels in the area. I think they're trying to scare us so we don't go fishing there. When I see the boat, it reminds me of everything that happened, and I feel scared that it might happen again. Was the collision intentional? China insists it was an accident. Despite his anxiety, Junel continues to fish in the disputed waters for three or four weeks at a time. He's the captain of a new boat with around 20 crew. The Filipino fishermen attach long canoes called pirogs to the main vessel. Their setup is basic compared to the might of the Chinese militiamen. I tie the rock to the string. Then I place the hook with the bait and then I throw it into the water. Our boats are made of just a few pieces of wood nailed together, but they're light, whereas the Chinese boats are made of metal and they're much bigger. It's arsy. This zone belongs to the Philippines, and they have their own zone. So why do they keep coming here? In response to Chinese aggression, the Philippines has moved closer to the US. 
But if war breaks out, the conflict will probably be much closer to the Chinese coast, in Taiwan. The island, located southwest of the Chinese mainland, is a prime location for a major war. Beijing regards it as a renegade province, to be retaken at all costs. Any conflict would probably begin here on the Taiwanese island of Kinmen. Its 140,000 residents are just a 20-minute boat ride from the mainland. They see China every day. There are tons of skyscraper just building over another building and another building and another building. <laughs> like New York? This Chinese New York is Xiamen, a city of 4 million people, 30 times the population of Kinmen. Stella, who's Taiwanese, spent four years at university there. Today, the 30-year-old is back in Taiwan with her family. It's only about three kilometers away. Uh, we're, I guess we're the nearest Taiwanese territory, you know, to China. Before the 1990s, bathing in the sea was banned in Kinmen. These fortifications are a reminder of the tense situation at the time. It was built for the wars to delay the boat from landing. Um, yeah, there used to be a very intense war in the back, so all the beaches in Kinmen has this. In 1949, Chiang Kai-shek and his followers were defeated by Mao Zedong's Red Army. The general fled to the islands, along with almost two million people who did not want to live under communism. And so began Taiwan's life as a breakaway province. Today, 23 million Taiwanese live in a peaceful democracy, but the threat of a Chinese invasion is never far away. decided to attack us, it's just a matter of 30 minutes or an hour. And it basically means we don't really have a chance to escape. Stella has two children and is pregnant with a third. Despite the looming threat, Kinmen's residents do not appear concerned as they go about their daily lives. Stella, a consultant for a multinational tech company, works remotely at home. It's not an entirely normal house. Time. <laughs> this is my bunker at home. Actually, all, all the neighbors here have a bunker at their home. You, you see, it's a small space because the wall is very thick. So when the bomb hits, they will have some protection. Today, the family's attending a festival. <laughs> Residents of Kinmen want a peaceful relationship with Beijing. That's no surprise. Here, war is not a vague threat, but an unforgettable memory. In 1949, there was a war here. These are the bullet holes left behind. You can see over here, too. Li Kai Chen was a boy when Kin Men was under siege by Mao's forces. The US intervened in the 1950s, threatening to use nuclear weapons if the communists took Kin Men. Between 1958 and 1978, the Chinese bombed the island every other day, 
showering small frontline islands in the Taiwan Strait with about one million shells. The area is peaceful today, but Lee, an oyster farmer, remembers the turmoil and fear. <laughs> Good. They are very tender. We harvest them once a year. Like many people living on Kinmen, Li welcomes closer political and economic ties between Taiwan and China in the 1990s. But he's worried that the relationship is souring. Because we Kinmen people already know the horrors of war. We've been through multiple wars. We don't want war. We want peace. Li also knows that Kinmen will be incapable of defending itself. Chiang Kai-shek's legacy is now a tourist attraction. For decades, his propaganda, broadcast over loudspeakers, was directed across the sea towards the mainland. Today, the message from Kinmen to China is one of peace. We return to Taiwan's main island, 160 kilometers from China. In a war scenario, the main objective of the Chinese would be to seize the capital, Taipei. This former Air Force Lieutenant General is particularly critical of Taiwan's war preparations. In the event of an invasion, China would initiate a blockade of the Taiwan Strait, followed by missile and artillery attacks on important targets such as radar posts, missile sites, airports and ports. Then it would launch amphibious landings involving airborne troops, helicopter-borne forces and amphibious units to quickly occupy Taiwan. The operational tempo would be rapid, aiming for a decisive victory within three to seven days. We have a population of 1.4 billion. Taiwan only has 20 million people. You can imagine how many people there are in the pro-Taiwan independence forces. So in the future, when the two million strong PLA decides to reconquer Taiwan, there'll be no match for us. As some foreign friends put it, it would be like placing a big watermelon on a sesame seed. The Chinese have spent years preparing for an invasion. They've built four times as many warships as the Americans. The Chinese Navy now boasts 370 vessels, compared with fewer than 300 for the US. If Taiwan falls and is unable to respond, the Communist Party of China could become the leading power in the world and trigger the decline of U.S. global influence. In October 2022, the U.S. President, Joe Biden, made a comment that surprised many observers. Are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? Yes. You are. That's the commitment we made. Biden's declaration raised the spectre of a third world war and had some people preparing for the worst. This is a military-grade mask for use in wars that involve nuclear, chemical and biological weapons. These 40 civilians are training in the mountains of Taiwan. The organizers simulate chemical and nuclear attacks to test their resistance.
This training is organized by a military official. The aim, to prepare the people for a modern, complex war. Regardless of whether war happens today or not, my preparations assume that if it breaks out, I'll be ready. In Taiwan, more and more people like me are preparing for war. Fear of nuclear war runs high in nearby Japan, for understandable reasons. It was like an enormous crack of thunder. The window of my house suddenly bulged inward, broke a great noise like bam, and broke into a thousand pieces. Outside, the adults were moving around in a strange way, like zombies. They had come from the epicenter. They were injured and bleeding. Normally, blood is red, but they were all gray. The trees and flowers growing in front of our house all lost their color and became gray too. Atomic bombs remove all the color from the world. This is me. I was four years and four months old. For decades, Masakazu Masukawa refused to talk about his experience. But he began speaking out a few years ago, concerned that the lessons of the tragedy would be forgotten. The 81-year-old is one of about 100,000 survivors of the atomic bombings on Japan who are still alive today. Neither we nor our parents have experienced war. But today there is war between Russia and Ukraine. Right now, at this very moment. As he was speaking, I imagined my own family dying. That thought alone is unbearable, yet it happened to him. <laughs> Before the war in Ukraine, some students would sleep or talk while I told my story. They didn't really listen. But now they do. I can tell that it has affected them. After the Second World War, people believed radiation sickness was contagious. The survivors were shunned and struggled to find marriage partners. They were treated like outcasts in a country that longed to move on from the bombings. Masukawa is visiting a US base in Japan for the first time. Although it has the self-defense forces, Japan, like other Asian democracies, relies on its security alliance with the US. Sasebo is a sprawling, strategically vital naval base in Japan. A public relations official shows us around. This ship is massive. <laughs> Not compared to the main ship, that's even bigger. This shipyard is home to nine warships, almost 4,000 service personnel and one-third of the US Navy's stock of missiles and munitions. In the event of a conflict over Taiwan or an attack from North Korea, the US response would come from here. 
Nagasaki is where the bomb fell, right here. And now I hear worrying things about North Korea and their missile tests. I'm very worried. In 2022 and 2023, North Korea test-fired a record number of missiles, most of them in the direction of Japan. We can't ignore this threat and pretend we don't need the Americans. I worry Nagasaki will be hit again, not by an atomic bomb this time, but by a nuclear attack that leaves it in ruins. It will be a disaster. Japan has more U.S. bases on its soil than any other American ally. We treasure the alliance between Japan and the US. But we also organize joint drills with Australia, the UK, France, Canada and India. We conducted a military drill with France and the US for the first time on Japanese territory. It's crucial to ensure peace, stability and freedom in the Indo-Pacific region. The Japanese government wants NATO, comprising the US and its European allies, to open a liaison office in Tokyo, leading to accusations by Beijing that Washington is trying to form an Asian NATO. We return to Taipei. Is war inevitable here? One hour from the capital, in the heart of Taiwan's Silicon Valley, we get a better idea of why the island is so important. This tech park is home to 610 companies with a combined turnover of 50 billion euros, as well as high-tech laboratories with dust-free environments. These engineers produce tiny, precious semiconductors. Without these chips, none of our consumer electronic products, computers, mobile phones, or even our cars would be able to function. Taiwan is by far the biggest manufacturer of chips, accounting for more than 60% of the global market. Our government have a very good foreseeable have a view to decide to develop IC technology in 1970. Uh, because in this uh, industry, it, the, the, we, Taiwan is uh, short of the natural resources. So we decided to uh, work on the IC uh, industry big, uh, technology. Mostly we are advanced than the, the company in uh, mainland China. Taiwan provides more than a third of the semiconductors used by Chinese industry and 90% of the most modern chips. If it attacked Taiwan, China would end up hurting its own economy. The uh, whole uh, IC industry and the supply chain will be destroyed. Not only is it harmful in Taiwan, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's very bad for the, the global uh, condition because actually mainland China is the most, uh, the largest demander for the IC chips. So I don't believe they want to do that. For Taipei, the semiconductors are a form of insurance, acting as protection against an attack from China and leaders in the chip industry are seen as guarantors of Taiwanese security. This is the electrical bicycle, also contain the semiconductor inside. This actually is in the, in the Volkswagen cars, uh, contain our chip inside. And then this is from the Hyundai, same as your cameras. Your camera has a lot of silicon inside, you know. You know, Ukraine and the Russian war is more localized war. The impact's much smaller. But Taiwan semiconductor, you, you know, semiconductor become the foundation of the uh, world economy. So if semiconductor plant 
been destroyed, then that will be a disaster. So that's why the whole world economy will be set back by 20 years. China, whose economic growth began slowing down last year, would have much to lose in a conflict with Taiwan. It would have to start manufacturing the latest semiconductors, as it would no longer be able to rely on the island it has invaded. The close relationship between Taiwan and China is not just economic. It extends to their history and culture, a factor some believe makes war unlikely. Yeah, ow. a little hurt. Oh. I think I'm not doing that very great. So. Like all other young Taiwanese men, Hao is about to begin his military service. The 20-year-old has Chinese ancestry, like 90% of Taiwanese people. He's proud of his roots and isn't afraid to show it. Boys, please. His new haircut means he can put on this traditional Manchu wig <laughs> and take selfies. My grandpa come from uh, mainland China, from Beijing, from Shandong to Taiwan for uh, about 80 years ago. Yeah, and I'm a Manchurian, and this is the Manchurian's uh, traditional hairstyle. Yeah, I grew up here. So I love this place, and, but I also love mainland China. How would even like Taiwan to be peacefully reunified with China? But if it comes to war, this soldier's loyalty to Taiwan is unshakable. In a situation that they, uh, they attack Taiwan first, I would think, I, I, I would be very sad. But uh, I think uh, it's reasonable to fight against them. We meet Hao again, this time with his parents, as he prepares to begin his military service. The recruits have assembled at Taipei's main railway station. On January the 1st, Taiwan's government extended mandatory military service from four months to one year, a reflection of current tensions. I'm scared. If war starts, there are so many casualties. I'm still excited for it because something is big just going to happen. I'm changing another environment to, to, to live my life. If Donald Trump, who opposes the US's role as the world's policeman, is elected president again later this year, many fear America's commitment to the island's defense could vanish. And that could act as a green light to a Chinese invasion. Mm -hmm.